shit, Echo Grande's a person, what? So my lovelies, I know it's been quite a while. Last time you saw my face on this channel was... <laughs> Yeah, I still need to take that down. And I know the most signature thing I've done on EG are reviews. So I figure since it's been just over a year, why don't we get back into it talking about <laughs> Shit, that's not right, um. Star, Galactica, Trek. No, I'm getting there. It's, um, oh yes. <laughs> Let's cut all the introductory bullshit and get right into it. Walter Frey is having a feast at the Twins. Wait, we saw him get his throat cut last season. What the hell's going on? It's Arya. Passes around proper wine for proper heroes to all of his soldiers and his family. It's Arya. Starts talking about the Red Wedding. It's Arya. As if the vengeance for her brother and mother couldn't get any better. We get to see all the Freys. All of them. Throwing up, spitting blood, bending backwards over tables. Gee, it sounds a lot like my family after eating my mom's turkey at Thanksgiving. You know that post quitus smoking sesh, but instead of a cigarette, it's weed laced with unicorns and dreams made out of Sour Patch Kids? Metaphors! That's how great that opening was. Arya walks out like a badass and roll the credits. Whew, sorry. Nipples got a little jumpy. I remembered how epic that theme song is. Cut to a winter wasteland where a puff of smoke is slowly creeping up on the camera. We get it, Night King, you vape. As the smoke envelops the camera, we see a typical populace of people walking out of Chipotle after the opening of their new buffet restaurant. Literally just made that up, Chipotle. Get on that shit. As the whites walk past the camera, probably on their way to a Marilyn Manson concert, we start to see bigger and bigger zombies getting closer, including... One one? Someone please confirm for me if the giant that they get a close-up shot on isn't one one. The one place I'd least expect Bran to be, he is at the gate of the wall. Edison Tollett, the new commander of the Night's Watch, welcomes Bran and his girlfriend. Companion. With a little racism, accusing them of being wildlings. But Bran proves he is indeed Bran, and Ed lets them in. More of a nice guy Eddie than nice guy Eddie actually was. <laughs> Back in Winterfell, Jon's having a council talking about how to mine dragonglass. And a northerner objects to the idea of both boys and girls going to work. Hooray, sexism. In comes Lyanna Mormont with Play of the Game. As she puts this objecting northerner in his place. What a badass little lady. Don't forget, kids, she's only 12. Jon orders the wildlings to take over Castle Black and the rest of the Night's Watch castles. Greatest irony ever. Argument ensues yet again as John wants to give the castles of the families who betrayed the North back to the families who betrayed them. Can I just say that John Snow Targaryen? John Targaryen knows how to sell a pitch. This guy came such a long way, and now look how perfect he is at debating. Kit Harrington is single, right? He isn't? Well, shit. Sansa and John have their own debate as Sansa roasts her brother Rob for not being as intelligent. Says the red-headed bitch who fantasized about marrying Joffrey. John receives a passive-aggressive letter from the new queen, Cersei, telling him either to claim her as queen or he'll die. John responds, Okay. Meanwhile, in King's Landing, Jamie and Cersei are having a discussion over what appears to be a painting of the entirety of Westeros. Looking at these two's appearance, these two have come a long way. Both have short hair, one's missing a hand, one's missing her mind, and yet they can still talk like they want on a bang 24 7. All I'm thinking is when is Jamie gonna upgrade to Queen Slayer? Come on, you know it's coming. Anyway, the scene really goes nowhere except it plugs Cersei's lines from the trailer, but there was a part in it I least expected the most. It was like a little cherry on top to what was said in the trailer. You know how it goes enemies to the east, enemies to the north, to the south. And then she adds, Ilaria Sand and her brood of bitches. I'll never be able to watch the season 7 trailer without laughing at that part. Really takes away the epicness. Hey, but you know what? I don't care. Cersei speaks the true true. I am not a fan of the Sand Snakes. She continues to be a bitch when Jamie brings up Tommen. Ooh. Cersei gets even more upset as Jamie continues to pound her with cynicism. As he tries to convince Cersei that they truly are outnumbered. But wait. A rare thing happens right after this. Something that we rarely see, if ever, on this show. Cersei shows off her intelligence, what? In comes a convoy of ships with a familiar kraken on the sails. Turns out Cersei wants to ally with Euron Greyjoy by wedding and bedding him. Oh, it gets better. So they can ally and defend King's Landing from Danny and her glorious cavalry. Now what comes next is something that I did not expect. A Euron Greyjoy scene that's actually enjoyable. I hate to be honest, I was not a fan of the Greyjoy arc in season six. The only good thing about it was Theon's futile attempt at redemption, which we all knew was coming. I mean, even after Theon comes home to help his sister claim the throne, and then in comes this wacky nutjob claiming to be their uncle, and all that takes place over like five, six episodes. In season six, Euron was cringy at best, and the whole storyline was just meh, but here Euron surprised me. 
Won't go much into that, could change in a heartbeat, considering he still couldn't talk his way into Cersei's pants even in this scene that lasts like 5-6 minutes. When we cut to what I swear to god could easily be confused for a scene out of Harry Potter with all the shots of books. But it's obvious where we are, we're at the Citadel now. Sam's there cleaning and dumping shit and serving cold soup to his fellow workers. I really like this scene because the way it was filmed like one of those Kit Kat commercials, you know what I'm talking about. He's working on his maestry with Inspector Butterman from Hot Fuzz. As Butterman reveals that pretty much everyone at the Citadel does not believe the White Walkers exist. The guy working with Sam, I'm just gonna keep calling him Butterman, preaches about how everything has a beginning and an end. <coughs> Foreshadowing the collapse of the wall. All this insightful crap he's saying and he still says he believes what Sam has to say. As if the Harry Potter references couldn't stop there, Sam asks for access to the restricted area. Probably to find out a way how to beat Darth Vader or whoever the main bad guy was in those books. <laughs> Not much to go on from there as we cut back to Winterfell for our latest batch of flirting between Tormund Giantsbane and Brienne of Tarth. Okay, Tormund, why don't you just put your head right here? And Brienne, come on, come in here. You put your head right here. Now, you guys take your heads here and just kiss. Littlefinger shows off his teleportation skills yet again as he creeps up on Sansa for more weird flirting. But Sansa shows off her backbone yet again as she tells Baelish to fuck off. Arya travels through the Riverlands and finds a group of Lannister soldiers. The soldiers in Arya talk, not having any idea who she is. Arya showing off her own brand of Stark badassness as she completely disguises who she is. <sighs> then we go into the whole not every stormtrooper is bad trope, as the soldiers start giving expositional reasons why Arya shouldn't cut their throat. But we know she will. One soldier talks about missing going fishing with his father, and another talks about how his wife is having a baby. Also, Ed Sheeran is here for some reason. Assumably as the scene cuts, Arya starts slashing away as we jump to the Hound. Turns out he took up Beric Dondarrion's offer to head north to the Wall, as they come across a cottage in the woods with two corpses in them. Little bit of tension as Beric and the Hound reminisce about the good old days, and we know what happens when someone starts being nice to someone they've always been a dick to. But thankfully the show is being nice to us this scene, as Thoros of Mir convinces the Hound to look into a campfire, where the Hound himself sees the Night King's army marching towards the Wall, and something about a castle at the edge where the Wall meets the sea, and then out of nowhere the fire explodes. Explodes. Really glad that that happened instead of what I was expecting. I was convinced that it was just the Hound pulling a prank on the Brotherhood. I see a mountain looks like an arrowhead. And a castle. Where inside I'm pissing on your mother's wedding dress. <laughs> Am I fired? Later during the night, Thoros starts hearing really strange noises. He goes out to investigate and finds the Hound burying the bodies of the man and girl that they found in the house. And here's a neat callback that I really enjoyed. It's the farmer and his daughter who fed Arya and the Hound back in season four. Nice little callback and the fact that it's the Hound burying them. At this point, almost gives the Hound more heart than Arya. As if the reasons for why I love the Hound just had to keep going, they keep going. Back to the Citadel, Sam gets his access to the restricted area and finds out that Dragonstone, where Stannis was stationed, is a big mountain of dragon glass. Which for those who don't know, is essentially this show's kryptonite. As he's walking down a hallway giving food to locked up patients, a rocky, almost grayscaly arm lunges out at him, asking if a certain Daenerys Stormborn has made landfall yet. Said in a voice so handsome that it's obvious we all know who it is. Gendry! Meanwhile, Danny does make landfall at Dragonstone while her theme song 2.0 starts playing, with Tyrion and literally 50% of the Game of Thrones cast in tow. She enters the main hall where her new temporary throne is waiting for her, looking like the logo for Touchstone Pictures, as we get those epic trailer shots of Danny stroking the war table and Tyrion checking out those weird, bony looking creature statues on the wall. Danny takes her place at the end of the table, locks eyes with her hand, and with three simple words, launches Game of Thrones Season 7 paper or plastic. Oh shit, I'm out of frame. Well, it certainly wasn't season six's premiere, so we got that going for us, which is nice. All in all, great start. Seems a little bit like they're going with the same formula as season six with the buildup and climactic action, which also kind of worries me considering this season is only seven episodes long. Not a lot of room for filler. But that being said, I'm sticking to my guns. This is going to be the best season of Game of Thrones, and possibly of all time in television. Just the sheer amount of effort it takes to make this world, and put characters in it, and make them easy for us to understand, for newcomers and people returning to the series. Just a heads up, if you are new to Game of Thrones, and you're starting with season 7, or season 7 of any show for that matter, Anyway, just like last year's premiere, there really wasn't much to go on. Just trying to go into as much detail as possible and then put in my input later. That being said, all in all, 
very strong opening. We got a lot of satisfying moments that should have happened three seasons ago, and we're just touching the tip of the iceberg with the juicy stuff. I know it's coming. And there we have it. All in all, a very strong episode. Nothing felt like it was served to us on a silver platter, and nothing in this episode really happened that felt unnecessary. We literally got part two of Arya's revenge. We got exposure to Sam's admittedly humorous quest to becoming a maester. The rift between Cersei and Jaime is only getting bigger. Danny is literally standing on a giant mountain of dragonglass as she begins her plan to take back Westeros. Jorah Mormont is in good hands at the Citadel. Jon and Sansa are brother and sister again. Littlefinger's still a creep. The Hound's fluffiness level tripled in size. And Bear Eric Dondarrion as main character material now? All in all, great job, D.B. David. You guys pulled it off. I expected a bit stronger of a launch off, but after last season where you kept the goodies just a little bit out of reach, it was hella worth it. Anyway, that's a wrap. Tune in next week where I'm going to talk about episode two. If you want to hear more of this sexy voice that sounds like a piece of aluminum going through a meat grinder, check out my podcast, Digital Leftovers, where we talk about stuff. Also, don't forget to subscribe to my channel so you don't miss next week's review, because you know what's coming. Just kidding, no one's going to know what's going to happen this season. This has been another Echo Review. Thanks for watching. You know what's coming at you. My name is Matt and I am signing out.